Hello. Um, I'm Effie. I have studied physics and distributed scientific computing and decided to pursue neither of those. Uh, I have worked in small organizations and startups and I've been with the foundation for about nine, sorry, <laughs> and I've been with the foundation for about uh, 10 months now. And Alex? Uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alexos Koskiaris and I am an SRE at the Wikimedia Foundation for about five, six years now. Uh, and uh, instead of talking about me, let's actually do a question here. Which of you actually types wikipedia.org, ELN, or whatever other language? You actually do. You don't go through Google. That's not what our stats tell us. <laughs> Back at you. Um, so, um, this is one of the very popular uh, interview questions that uh, we do, uh, many organizations do, where the interviewee is supposed to answer what happens when they type a website from the client side. And today we're going to talk about what happens on the server side and specifically on our server side. Um, this idea came while Alex was onboarding me and I was thinking that I could listen to those things even we, if I wasn't getting paid for it. So, um, and the structure of this talk is as follows. Uh, we're gonna first say a few introductory things about uh, our team, about the foundation, about Wikipedia, and then we're gonna uh, describe our infrastructure starting from uh, the inside out. So we're gonna talk about the application layer, storage, databases. Uh, then we're gonna continue with uh, approaching this from the outside in. from the outside in, so how you hit our production systems. And finally, we're gonna uh, discuss a few miscellaneous things, like how we manage to manage. And we have anything else? That's all. So uh, all information we have here is simplified because our goal is to present something that is understandable without the complex uh, details. So did you know that uh, the, Wikipedia, the Wikipedia infrastructure is run by the Wikimedia Foundation, which is uh, a nonprofit organization in the United States? We are about 350 people around the world. Five of us are in Athens, well, four. And uh, we have no affiliation with WikiLeaks. And if you find this funny, we don't. Um, all content is managed by volunteers, by our editors. Uh, we support 304 languages. The project is about 18 years old, and we host some really bizarre articles like list of uh, unusual deaths, list of helicopter escapes, and other, and other ones. But unfortunately, those articles, along with million others, uh, can't be read in Turkey and China, which means that about 1.5 billion people don't have access to Wikipedia. Apart from Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation is hosting other projects um, like Wikicode, uh, Wikiversity, Wikinews, uh, Wikidata, which is uh, run by Wikimedia Deutschland, and others which I suggest you check out. Um, so a few things about our infrastructure. Uh, we are using only open source software. We have two primary, we have five uh, data centers, two primary ones uh, in, uh, in Virginia, United States, and Texas. And we have three caching sites uh, in uh, California, Amsterdam, and uh, Singapore. We serve about 17 billion uh, page views per month, and we do have a definition of how we define how we measure that. We have 300,000 new editors every month, and all those things run in about 1,300 uh, bare metal servers. Now, if you're wondering why we're not using the cloud, um, there are three simple reasons. First of all, we want to have control over our data and who has access to it. And this makes sense if you're an editor who is, not, who is editing things in countries they're not supposed to. Um, it's cheaper when you're serving that much traffic, it's cheaper to own your infrastructure than renting it. And finally, when this project started, there was no such a thing as the cloud. Um, <coughs> Uh, with the site reliability engineer, uh, engineering team, is, uh, we are 26 people and we're responsible for uh, the development and maintaining of our production systems. We are divided into five sub-teams, uh, the data center operations team, uh, the people who physically take care of our servers, uh, the data persistence team, also known, also known as uh, the database administrators, who are something like unicorns these days, uh, the infrastructure foundations team, they are mending all our tools like configuration management, logging, monitoring, uh, service operations team, where me and Alex 
belong to. We do services like MediaWiki and Kubernetes. And finally, uh, traffic te our traffic team deals with our networking edges and crashes. And over to Alex. So let's start by describing our application layer. Now remember the topic, the structure of the talk is from the inside out. So the main application that we have is MediaWiki. It's our core application and it's been around uh, for quite a lot of years. Uh, Wikipedia is already, as we said, 18 years old. We are currently working on an 18 year old software, although it has gone a couple of rewrites already. Uh, and it's PHP, Apache plus MySQL, yes. And uh, it's again our big, big hammer. Uh, in fact, it has been used to solve problems that today there are way better software for that. Uh, but it's powering up our, all of our wiki pages. Whenever you visit uh, Wikipedia via your desktop browser, you're always, always gonna, at the end, interact with it. Uh, we have our clusters for this software. Again, as I said, we use it as a hammer for everything. So we have our API app servers cluster, which is when you actually view a, a page. We also have an API cluster, which is when it gets used when you interact with Wikipedia in a number of ways. For example, we have a visual editor, which is what you see is what you get editor. At the end, your browser is gonna interact with this API cluster. And of course, as I said, Hammer, third time that I say that, we have a job runners slash video scalers cluster because we use MediaWiki for image. And we used to use MediaWiki for image scaling, but we currently use it for video scaling. That is when a volunteer, an editor, uploads a video. It needs to be transcoded into various others, uh, resolutions and codecs. Yes, it's MediaWiki that does that. Although that's not particularly great. Uh, so, how does this, all of this work? Like, uh, how it is possible uh, that this thing actually works with all the traffic that it needs to serve? So, uh, you can see there in the middle circle, we have MediaWiki and uh, all around them, there are caches. All of those caches are used to literally unburden MediaWiki of having to deal with your request, guys. That's what all of those caches do. So we have in the uh, Apache software, we have the, op, then the, the PHP software, we have the op cache and the APC cache. Those are caches that go around and cache the various operations in code that need to happen. Uh, and then we have two other sets of caches, a Redis, uh, a clustered Redis uh, with replication, which uh, we're storing sessions on. And in order to be able to address this in a highly available way, we use a software that, well, we wrote in Nutcracker. It's also known as TWM Proxy. It's our software written by Twitter, and it resides on every single server and has connect, opens connections to all of the various Redises. It uses consistent hashing algorithm and does load balancing in order to allow for one Redis server to go down and still maintain availability of the service. Same thing goes for Memcached and MacRouter, which is a different software. It's written by Facebook. And then we have this specialized thing at the, top right, at the bottom right of the slide, which is a parser cache. And finally enough, this thing is in MySQL. What this thing is, is when we have articles that are uh, need to be reparsed, regenerated, we keep uh, an intermediate form of the parsed thing in MySQL in a key value store so that it is easily uh, reparsed, let's say, although it's only intermediately parsed, in order to generate the final page. And uh, as already said, we had this MediaWiki thing doing everything, and we realized at some point that's not really tenable anymore. So back in 2014, uh, the very first microservice showed up. It was uh, called, it is called Parso, it still exists. And as a service, uh, it does just one thing, it parses from Wikitext, which is our markup language. If you've never seen it, think a bit like a variant of Markdown, although Markdown greatly predates, uh, Wikitext greatly predates Markdown. Uh, and it does, and Perso it does Wikitext to HTML and vice versa processing. And fast forward to 2018, and that word cloud there has all the various little software that is there and does various stuff. And uh, so why do we actually do this uh, transition? Aside from uh, the obvious problem of using MediaWiki as a hammer for everything and treating all our problems as nails, we also had other issues. 
Uh, we have problems with elasticity, as I already said. An editor may upload a video and it needs to be transcoded into all the various other codecs and resolutions. But the thing is, an editor uploading a video is fine. When an editor shows up and decides to upload 1,000 videos or 10,000 videos, things are starting to get a little bit more difficult. And then when, that's when we find out our video scaler cluster uh, being brought to its knees and you know things lag. It's not like we have an outage or something, but things lag there. Uh, also, we are doing this migration to adopt all the various uh, improvements that have happened in this industry in the last uh, years. Uh, one of them is that it allows us to avoid hardware faults. Uh, we are, again, very bare metal, and hardware faults used to bite us. Things are getting a little bit better uh, these days. And the other thing that we're also getting from this uh, adoption of new platforms, uh, like Kubernetes, which I'm going to talk about later, is that we make deployments easier. Guess what? We have our own deployment tooling, one that is called SCAP, and we build in-house, and we use it, and of course, it has its own set of problems. And at the end of the day, our mission is not really to write deployment tooling. So if we can adopt uh, what the industry has to offer, it's way better. And guess what? The migration is not easy. And it's ongoing for at least two years now. So uh, let me talk about a few of these microservices so that I can give you an idea. We have Thumbor, which is a software that we haven't really written. We have contributed to, and it's used for image scaling. So as of a couple of years ago, we no longer use MediaWiki for image scaling. So yay, no reason to anymore from an entire server just for this. Uh, we have a software that we have written our, but uh, it was written by one of our volunteers. It's called Mathoid. And what it does, it renders LaTeX from, uh, it renders from LaTeX PNG and SVG versions of math formulas. Uh, if you go to any kind of wiki page, wiki, uh, Wikimedia page that contains a math formula, you have interacted with it. We have a software that uses machine learning to help uh, with anti-vandalism efforts. It scores the various revisions uh, per the probability that they are spam or uh, bad faith or anything like that. And we have a mobile content service that is modifying page content on the fly. And if you use the Wikimedia the app for iOS or Android, you've interacted directly with it. So as I already said about microservices, uh, the thing about them is you need to have a platform. Uh, up to now, we did not have a really good platform for that, so we're adopting the current uh, industry standard, which is Kubernetes. Uh, but we are not moving too much away from our uh, roots. So it's bare metal. It's not on the cloud. Uh, that means that we had to go around and set up the clusters all ourselves. We have two clusters currently, uh, two that are production, one per data center. And we're growing them uh, as we see fit. And we have one staging one uh, in order to be able to test the various uh, software that gets released there. It's still little, relatively small, uh, relatively little numbers of software that we have there. It, if I remember correctly, it's like nine different services up there at this point. And uh, we're improving. We already are bound to deploy two more this quarter and another two next quarter. And yes, the mathematical formulas I was talking about, they are powered by this platform. Uh, we are uh, using Helm, again, industry render for deployments powered by, uh, on t and on top of it, we have a Helm file for that. We will be having Helm file for that. And we're using Calico as a CNI plugin because it's the thing that we realized fits best our model. And uh, well, the container runtime engine is, of course, uh, Docker. Because what else? <laughs> Although there are some developments in this area. Let's move on to our message queuing. Yes, we do need message queuing for a number of reasons. Let's actually see which uh, those reasons are. But before that, let me talk about what we use as a message queuing software. Uh, it's Apache Kafka. Uh, it was originally uh, started as an analytics only thing. That is, we have a team that's called analytics and it does various, it, it hosts a data lake that allows us to do various statistics on our uh, viewers and editors. Uh, but now it's our de facto solution. Whenever we need some queuing, that's where we go. 
And uh, events that are actually served by this are things like, for example, Wikitex template refreshes. Uh, the best example for this is that, you know, when you've gone to Wikipedia and you've seen the article of a city, on the right-hand side, there is a little sidebar. That sidebar is actually a template and stored in a different Wikitech page, not in... Uh, the actual page that you're viewing. So when somebody goes around and adds, say, one more uh, line in, in this specific sidebar, population, all of the pages need to be re-rendered for you to be able to see them. And that's where you use Kafka in order to throttle this and uh, serve it uh, reliably. We also need to purge our edge caches, which are uh, very important in all of this. Uh, we have things like cross wiki links. For example, you might be linking from uh, English Wikipedia to Wikidata and back forth. That's actually a pattern that sees more and more adoption every day. And of course, we have the needs for creating new thumbnails when uh, a new thumbnail is being uploaded or uh, a new image being uploaded. And again, the videos that I talked about earlier. And uh, moving forward to databases, back to F. So um, databases, uh, the dungeon of every infrastructure. Uh, it's run by our lovely DBA team. <clears throat> we use it, we use, we, uh, it, this is a PHP Apache MySQL application. We're not using MySQL, we're using uh, MariaDB. We switched for some complicated reasons, we switched back in 2013. We use uh, MariaDB to store uh, metadata, like uh, revisions, uh, editors and things like that. Wikitext, the actual content of the articles, they are stored in, uh, in different clusters. And we use, it, use, we use it for parser cache that Alex explained uh, before. Uh, the database clusters, they are divided into sections and each wiki belongs to a different section. And each section has uh, one master and many replica servers. Uh, Wiki, Media Wiki, it is uh, configured so to read uh, from, the slate, from the replicas and write only to uh, the master of each section. Um, I hope that this uh, tree is going to make things a little bit more understandable. Um, we do online schema migrations, which means that we start, when we have to alter tables, we start from uh, the slaves and sometimes it might take weeks for a migration to finish. We do uh, cross uh, data center um, and replication. Uh, if you see in the tree, uh, S section one has a naked, which is the Virginian one, has the master DB1067. It replicates to three replicas and a fourth one, which is in our uh, other primary center, uh, data center in Texas, DB2055. Uh, and uh, in turn, it replicates to its uh, replicas. And some numbers to show off. Uh, we store about 570 uh, terabytes of data and 150 uh, DB servers. We serve about 300, uh, 350,000 queries per second, and to do that, we need about 70 terabytes of RAM. We also use Elasticsearch, which is a text box on your uh, top right, which is run by a team that is called Search. Um, storage. I'm gonna briefly talk about storage. We use uh, OpenStack, uh, OpenStack Swift. It is an object storage uh, and scalable. Its two uh, key features are, first of all, that it talks HTTP, and secondly, that it's, it scales just by adding more servers and it takes care of uh, indexing and replication and all that. Uh, it has front-ends, the servers that serve the, the HTTP requests. It has back-ends who do the actual storing and retrieving of, um, of media. We store about one billion objects and they add up to about 390 terabytes of RAM. And now it's time to hit traffic. Now uh, we discuss a bit from the inside out, the application layer, the caches, databases, storage and stuff. And now we're going from the outside in, how you're hitting our infrastructure. Going back to the map, uh, we said we have three uh, caching points and two main data center. What does that mean? Uh, the, main the primary data centers, they do hold all our data, user data, articles, everything. And the caching sites, uh, they're responsible to terminate TLS for you and serve you static content. Um, the reason we do that is if you're in Europe, it is faster and cheaper to uh, terminate your encrypted connection in Europe and serve you content from Europe to Europe instead of do that from the United States, for example. Um, a fun fact, when we installed uh, the Singapore data center, which was in 2017, 
Um, it increased uh, Wikipedia readability in Asia because it reduced latency by 30%. Before that, half of Asia was served by the California data center and the other half from Europe. Um, also, our data centers, they are interconnected with each other using IPsec, meaning that uh, connectivity between them is encrypted. But we also, um, we also connect with other large networks like your provider's internet provider or Facebook or uh, Google. And if Pairing with, pairing with Facebook does not make sense. Uh, think of how many uh, links are posted on Facebook, and when you log into Facebook, you see the preview of the link. Um, and a fun fact here is that after the um, uh, 2016 United States election, we saw an increase in Facebook traffic in our systems. So um, this is a higher level uh, graph of our um, of, our, of how you hit our production. Uh, GDNSD will point you to their nearest data center, and then along with some complicated internet and routing magic, you hit our LVSs, uh, which will take you to um, our content delivery network. But um, let's explain what are all those things. Uh, GDNSD is a GeoDNS server. That means it has a list of all the IP addresses and the countries they belong to, and we have assigned its country to uh, a data center. <coughs> uh, this comes handy not just trap, uh, not because we are directing users to the nearest one, but it, it's helpful when we need to uh, depool or pull a data center. Uh, for example, if we are having issues in our Amsterdam data center. With the help of GDNSD, we can, within 10 minutes, route all the Europe traffic to the United States. Um, LVS is, uh, stands for the Linux Virtual Server. It is a layer three and layer four uh, load balancing, uh, balancing solutions for Linux. Um, you may have not heard it before, but you have used it because it's like 90% sure that your cloud providers are using it as well for load balancing. Um, and lastly, we have our own content management, content delivery network, our CDN, which looks like this a bit. So think of it as an onion that has different layers. The first layer is Nginx minus, and then is Varnish front end and Varnish back end. And we're going to <laughs> explain what those are. Uh, Nginx minus is a highly performant HTTP web proxy, and it's excellent for TLS termination. In other words, uh, this is where we encrypt your connect the, the connectivity between uh, our production and your computer. Uh, Varnish are divided into uh, Varnish is a cache, it's a very fast uh, caching uh, HTTP caching proxy with a really weird uh, language. <laughs> Um, the varnish frontends, uh, we divide them, the varnish caches into varnish frontends and varnish, varnish backends. The frontends, they store static content, CSS, HTML, all that stuff, uh, in memory. So they should be fast, and that is where we cache the really uh, hot objects that you keep requesting over and over again. And then we have the varnish um, backends who, do st who, do, uh, who store uh, locally. Uh, but we also divide those caches into varnish text to store um, text, HTML, CSS, JS, and all that, and varnish upload to store uh, media. Now, um, we have, I th just, let's hope that by now it's a bit understandable how we do things a bit. So it's time to bind all this together and tell you what really happens. Um, if you want to request the article for Athens, uh, GDN is, and you are here in Athens, GDNSD is going to point you uh, to uh, Amsterdam, and then you're going to hit our edge. You're going to hit um, uh, the, uh, the route, our, 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 uh, sorry, our routers and our LVSs. Then Nginx will help you encrypt this connection, and then it's going to forward this request to the varnishes. If that, if that URL is cached, you're going to get all your content, and this will be the end of our session. And like, and a really large percentage of our requests do end. Yeah, more than 90%. They do end in our, ca in our uh, caching layer. Now, um, if the Amsterdam data center does not have this URL cached, it's going to forward this request to our primary data center in Virginia. And the, the path is pretty much the same, and it's going to request the content from the Virginia caches. And if the Virginia caches don't have that content, then Varnish is going to forward this request to MediaWiki. And MediaWiki will do the best it can to render this content and return it to you. 
Um, the interesting part here is that if you're requesting um, uh, media, media. <laughs> if you're requesting media, uh, Varnish is, gone, is not going to uh, serve this request through MediaWiki, but, it's go in but instead it's going to directly ask for it from uh, Swift. And things do get a bit more complicated when, you're, when we are editing. So the path is pretty much the same. We don't have to repeat it. Um, and, but we do, and, we do, and eventually we do a post request to uh, MediaWiki. Uh, MediaWiki is going to store this request to uh, the master DB server. And it's going to start uh, many, many uh, jobs, like the ones that Alex mentioned before. Uh, purge HTTP caches for this article. Um, video scale, uh, uh, this is later, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, propagate changes to other pages. If this page belongs to a category, maybe refresh the category, and so on. Uh, pages can include other pages and other pages, so we, don't, we might not need to purge the cache of one page, but many pages. And when it comes to uh, uploading uh, media, MediaWiki will serve that the media file on Swift and its metadata to, uh, to, my, to my MariaDB. Um, it's going to ask Thumbor, if it is an image, it's going to ask Thumbor that we mentioned before to uh, create a thumbnail and maybe different sizes of that image. And if that image is, um, is a video, our video scalers will get an event to, to scale to um, to encode that into open source formats. And I think right now it's the right point to say what, that we have um, a phenomenon called um, celebrity death spikes. So when someone very, very famous dies, everyone links to Wikipedia to read about the death, while a bunch of editors, they're spiking the edits to update everyone about the deaths, and then other editors are nitpicking their changes. And this brings a lot of load in our systems. Uh, because every time there's an edit, we're purging caches over and over and over again, uh, which is a phenomenon we call the Michael Jackson effect. <laughs> and over to Alex. Yeah, the Michael Jackson effect was, was a very fun time. In which, time yeah. which one was the worst Michael Jackson effect? Michael Jackson? Michael Jackson's <laughs> worst work well. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the time when we actually implemented throttling in some of our uh, editing infrastructure in order to stop this thing from happening. Anyway, enough about the, the technical uh, stuff. Let's actually see how an SRE team of this size, again, uh, 26 people in the uh, SRE team, about 30 plus people in the, being SREs or operations engineers in the entire organization. So how are we actually managing all of this? And... Uh, for starters, we are very much about DevOps or OpsDev or SecDevOps, OpsDev, Sec. Or sysadmin. Or <laughs> <laughs> we don't say that anymore. <laughs> True. And I will not even say the word that was in the previous keynote, which was awesome, by the way. And so we adopt uh, infrastructure as code. We adopt also configuration management. We have everything that we possibly can under CV uh, VCS, Git, actually. Uh, although we used to also have subversion, we do as much CI and CD and testing as possible, and still it's not enough. I, I think we need more. And of course, we need orchestration because configuration management can only take you up to a specific point. You need more after that. And our adopted configuration management system is Puppet. And uh, we've adopted it since very early on, version 0 0.24 or 25, if I remember correctly, about 10 years ago, maybe even more. And we currently have about, an, okay, I know your developers and lines of code don't mean crap to, to you. Give. That's good. It shouldn't. But to give you a ballpark an idea of how much, uh, how big is our code base, we have around 50K lines of Puppet code. Not of all of this is actually written by us, but the majority is. We also do import uh, a few Puppet modules uh, from Puppet Forge. And we have around 100 key lines of Ruby and ERB. ERB is embedded Ruby is the way uh, Puppet actually allows you to render templates. Uh, so it's a rather a big code base that makes at times movement a little bit slower, uh, but at the same time it does allow us to adopt the entire methodology that I talked about. And then since Puppet can only get you as far as a specific point, 
We also have gone around and evaluated various orchestration uh, and automation tools. None really fit our needs, so we sat down and wrote uh, our own. It's called Cumin. And uh, it is in Python, it's developing house, and it has allowed us to uh, basically go around and execute remotely commands on a selected set of hosts. Its power is basically being able to select hosts on a, on a variety of predicates, like take all the job runners, but not the job runners that are in, in Amsterdam, or the job runner uh, in Virginia, sorry, and vice versa. And uh, that's about it as far as the SREs go, uh, technically. But what's also interesting is how do we cope with all of this socially? And uh, let me point out that we are a very globally distributed team. Uh, all 26 people are in various countries in the world. And yes, time zone and scheduling meeting is a pain. But we have a lot of remote meetings. Well, thankfully not a lot, not really a lot. Don't, yeah. We have remote meetings, fully remote. Actually, half of the organization plus is, that's a stat that's continually increasing, is remote. So we try to adopt a lot of remote first uh, stance. Uh, we use Google Hangouts, Google Meet, Google whatever it is. is Which is, is you know, open yeah, source. Whatever name it has. We, sh we actually evaluated open source tools. They are not there yet. Uh, we have collaborative and editing tools, apart from MediaWiki itself, which we use, of course, extensively for note-taking and stuff like this. We also have uh, Etherpad, which is an online collaborative editor. Uh, we are on IRC, and thank you, Slack, for existing and allowing us to be on IRC and talk to each other very nicely. <laughs> And uh, our code is in uh, Garrett, and we do a lot of code reviews, and we have to go around and uh, actually get a code review from a teammate before, or the person that is responsible for the code that we're changing, because we have the ability to change anyone's code, as long as we get a plus one from them, or a uh, plus two from somebody else who is responsible for that. Now, that's not something that always happens, unfortunately, but we try to uh, stick to it as much as possible. So we also do code reviews, so if we are to break Wikipedia, we do it collectively, and not just one person at a time. <laughs> um, takeaways. Um, what we want you to remember from uh, today is not just how our requests flow through our systems, but that it is possible to run the fifth uh, highest traffic website, for, depends on the year. It depends on the year and which benchmark you're using. Alexa at times puts us at top five, top six, top seven. And, and depends if China is blocking us or not. Um, it is possible to run a website like this running op using open source software and, not, and without having an army of engineers maintaining it, but only 26 and a few more in other teams. It is hard sometimes, uh, it is painful sometimes, but it works. And the other things we want, want to remember is that all the tools we mentioned here, they do, they do make sense in smaller environments. You don't have to be a super large, large website to need Varnish, or to need a, content, a small content delivery network somewhere else, or to need LBS. And a friendly message from our sponsors, we are hiring. Uh, keep checking in for, uh, for new job postings. Um, our fiscal year ends in a couple of months, so there will be new jobs posted there uh, after that. And thank you very much. questions for our awesome speakers. Hello. Did you actively try to avoid any kind of restrictions in countries like China or Sorry, Turkey? I, I didn't hear you. Did you, try to, did you actively try to avoid any restrictions in China and Turkey yeah, yeah, yeah. to do. make sure that your content is readable by everyone? Yeah, we do have a legal team that works, that works towards this. So if there, are, uh, th there were other blogs, maybe shorter ones in Venezuela, or maybe there were issues uh, with articles in France and other countries. So we do have a legal team that takes care of things like that. Any more questions? Hello. Um, you said you have about 26 uh, operations engineers 
and about 300 all R&D. Can you give, um, if possible, uh, some information how these 300 people are grouped and how they work as teams? Uh, we have three major uh, teams, departments. Uh, we have the audiences, the communications, and the technology. We belong to the technology one, and each one does have some extra engineers. But it's not strictly like those are the developers and those are doing uh, other things uh, for the organization. But do we have a number of how many uh, developers and engineers we have? Do you remember? So the technology department, which would be almost predominantly developers, it would be around 170 or 180 people. Audiences has a number of about 50, if I remember correctly, and everybody else is either a manager or a uh, CEO, CTO, legal team, administration, finance. finance, HR, and things like that. And one last question, because before we break up for coffee. Yeah, hi. So you mentioned that uh, one of the main reasons that you're not in the public cloud is user data, right? And who owns that? They're now in the US, if I understand correctly, the data centers. So is the US a safe place for that, you think? Well, uh, you know that? Actually, ah. So that's, that's actually a discussion that has uh, been crypto keeping up for years. In fact, we have volunteers that have uh, very highly questioned the fact that we are in the US, especially since the Trump administration uh, came into power. Uh, the thing is that currently we have a lot of protections against being eavesdropped and snooped and people tampering with our data centers. Our data centers are in have cages, you need locks, there are cameras that will alert us if somebody decides to, you know, creep in and things like that. Of course, our providers could be gag ordered, but then we would be noticing by technical means. So at this point, we still consider it safe enough to not warrant the cost of moving out of them. Thank you. Thank you. A big round of applause, guys. Thank you both.